Well, thank you. It is eight o'clock on uh, Tuesday, February 16th. It's above zero degrees. I just want that noted for the record. Uh, I might actually leave the house today. Um, I don't think I stepped outside once yesterday. Uh, so let's call this meeting to order. Uh, Olivia, would you uh, complete the roll call, please? Yes. We have Cameron Grant, Tom DeBee, Arlene Zortman, Lauren Selly, Jean Christopher, Lisa Gallinar, Polly Christensen, Kathy Fedler, Harold Dominguez, and Kendra Daniels. Thank you. Welcome, Polly. It's good to see you. Uh, uh, item number two, approval of the minutes from our January 19th, 2021 meeting. Those were in the packet. Do we have any uh, updates, corrections, or, or comments regarding the January 19th minutes? I move to approve them. Second. We have a motion and a second. Being no discussion, all in favor, thumbs up. Any opposed? None opposed, those are considered approved. Uh, item number three is public invited to be heard. And before the meeting started, we were notified that there were, there has been no one contacting uh, us requesting to be heard. So uh, unless anyone has shown up in the last minute and a half, we will move on to item number four, new and old business. And item, item 4A is review and adopt electronic participation policy <clears throat> for city of Longmont board and commission meetings. And that was included in your packet. Uh, is there anyone on staff that wants to give a bit of background on this? I think Karen was going to do this one. But let me jump in. And, and I'm not sure Karen has joined us yet. Yeah, I'm wondering if she's having technical issues. Let me. Uh... Pull that up. So generally on this one, um, we created just for you all um, sort of some the, the back story on this one. Um, as we moved into the, the COVID world and we had to have the um, electronic meetings via Zoom, we created a, um, sorry, somebody's calling me on Teams. We created the, um, this electronic policy. Um, and if you notice in the first uh, paragraph, um, emergency circumstances under which um, City of Longmont or commission may participate in board or commission meeting by telephone or other electronic means of participation, such as video conferencing. Um, and then we outline uh, the emergency situations in terms of where this can be enacted. Obviously for me is determining uh, that a meeting in person is not practical or prudent. Um, everyone can hear one another. Um, and then you, you can see the point on the public where they can hear it, and at least one board or commission is <clears throat> present at the, unless not feasible due to the pandemic or disaster. So this is really just pulling together what we've been doing. We've put this in place for the city council. We put it in place for all our other boards and commissions, and we just felt like we needed to add that for you all. I think it makes good sense since we're operating in that fashion anyway. <clears throat> right. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone have any questions or do we, can I entertain a motion to approve the policy? Tom? Yeah, I had a question. So number five says all votes are connected by roll call. I mean, is that, have they really been doing that during the meetings or is it, I mean, as long as you could see them and, and hear them, is that acceptable? If you can see them and hear them, it's acceptable. Um, our city clerk, um, sometimes if you watch the council meetings, mm -hmm. they'll mm -hmm. have to go, okay, who voted for what to make sure that it's clear. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, it needs to be clear. And we, we do that a num number of ways. So. Okay. All right. Do we have a motion? I will move to approve. Second. So Jean moved, Arlene seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor, thumb, thumbs up roll call. G 
unanimously approved. So we'll move on to item 4B, uh, advisory board members and resident engagement and discussing ideas for the uh, housing authority board to participate in that to ensure communication between resident staff and board. So, so this is an issue that, that we first started discussing, gosh, I don't know how long, a year or so ago, maybe a little bit less, um, and it got lost during the, the, the COVID time. Uh, but Arlene wisely reminded me about this, and so we thought we ought to put it on the agenda for discussion. And I think the concept was the the that there's some real value in communication, uh, and that that over the years there might have been less communication between the board in particular, and maybe others on staff and uh, our residents. And so we wanted to bring this back for discussion to explore ways we might uh, kind of stimulate this type of connection. Um, and so what I think I'll do, I'll turn it over to Arlene to get her initial thoughts and see where we take this. Arlene. Okay. Um, when I was able to visit some of the facilities earlier last year, one of the things that came up was that it would be nice if there were <clears throat> meetings where people could get together with board members and, you know, staff and just kind of talk about maybe some concerns or what's going good, that type of a thing. And I just kind of wanted to follow up on that because I think it's an excellent idea. However, as long as we have to do it this way virtual, I'm not sure that we'd get that many people to participate as compared to if we actually met it, met on each one of the facilities and open it up to the people that were there. So I think it's important to do. I'm just not sure when we can get going on it. I wonder if there's some value to, um, you know, even though this is a difficult time for everybody to to connect and communicate, there's some value just to having the option, even if only a handful of people take advantage of it. Um, you know, that might be, might be an opportunity for somebody who has a significant issue they want to discuss to reach out to us. Otherwise, they have to wait around until 8 a.m. on the second Tuesday or third Tuesday, whatever the the data is and uh, go from there. Do any of the facilities have um, places where they've got computers set up so people could actually go in and get on there rather than have to deal with it from home? It might be easier for them to do it that way. Your computer labs. Um, I'm trying to think. Some do, and I'm trying to... Th um, I know that that was something we were working on in Aspen Meadows apartments and I'm there's Karen and some do some don't I think is the answer Karen uh, uh, thanks Harold um, so, so I would say a couple things yeah so one some of the computer labs that were in operation um, the equipment got so old over time um, you know, that they re really were no longer um, usable. So there's, a, there's, so there is a couple things that we're, we're doing. Number one is, um, you know, we are working with uh, Hearthstone and Lodge since they now have, um, you know, broadband or uh, basically next night internet um, as, as part of their uh, utilities. So, um, so we are, working with them in the senior center in, um, in giving folks uh, Chromebooks to be able to have access for pe people who don't have, um, you know, have that technology. And we're also looking at a, um, a checkout system of Chromebooks at the suites, again, because they do have um, the, uh, they do have the uh, internet. Actually, we weren't able to get the internet at Hearthstone Lodge. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm incorrect. But so we are looking at how through a combination of um, Chromebooks that the senior center can give away and those that we can check out that was available through the CARES Act because we couldn't give them away. Um, so we're, we're trying to at least enhance um, access to devices for, for folks who don't have that. Um, so we're continuing to look, I guess, Arlene, at ways to address the digital divide because it is certainly a, um, an issue that we are 
um, concerned about and continue to look for resources to address those. And, and I think the other thing um, is that at, at some point you, um, you might want to invite Lisa to talk a little bit about what she and the community managers are starting to do to reach out and connect with residents. So um, bit by bit, as, as the, you know, as we can loosen things up a little bit, they, they are trying some different ways to engage. So at some point in this conversation, I would invite Lisa to participate, to um, <clears throat> chime in. And then if it's okay, I'm going to sh share my screen with you all. Um, and show you where we are so you can see what part of we're going to be dealing with. So in this, you can see, obviously, we're in the yellow dial. Um, one week, 116.1. We're in blue in terms of average positivity. Stable hospital. This is moving, and this is because you always anchor against low numbers. And so what I will tell you is, while it looks like our hospitalizations are going up, we're still significantly lower than where we were before. Um, and, and so this one, you have to understand that piece, but even if we move into blue, um, and you look at gatherings, even in blue, it's up, up to 10 from no more than two households. So even when we move to blue, I mean, that's going to be a challenge and we'll have to, so generally you could probably only have under this, the way this is described two people, two people. together who are from different units. And so this is the challenge that we're going to have ongoing. Um, and, and so what we were, we even thought, I even thought about finding a way to get a projector with a camera so we could talk to larger groups. Still won't work with the way the rules are working based on how you can get people together because of the household size. Um, and so I think we are going to have to work on finding a way to get people to connect. But I think let's, Lisa needs to talk about what they're doing too, to try to bridge that gap in the interim. Well, we did have Michelle um, go through, cause she's really involved with Boulder County Health Department, um, go through the guidelines. And we were allowed, we were allowed to have gatherings in like community areas, um, mm -hmm. social distance. So we did groups over at the Heartstone and the Lodge, did 15 minute gatherings with six household members and a couple staff members, and we set chairs 15, I'm sorry, 10 feet apart. So it allowed people to come in. Then we did these meetings every 10 minutes. So we had time to sanitize the whole build or the whole area, get the next group in, go through the same agenda, sanitize and go on. And we did six groups at each of the Heartstone and the Lodge over two days. Okay, I, I like that idea and I would be more than glad to, to participate if, if it was an option with you guys. Um, it sounds like a lot of work, but it also sounds like something that I like the idea of moving ahead with. Lauren's been patiently waiting with her digital hand raised. Um, what about outdoors? I have two things. Um, I think if we, when the weather gets better, obviously not now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe when things warm up, if we're able to do it outdoors, we'll be able to have more people, lots more people. Um, and it might be nice, you know, to get some fresh air coming up from all this year. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was for any um, locations that either don't have great internet access or, um, you know, we're having trouble getting technology into the hands of residents. Uh, Boulder County AAA Area Agency on Aging is launching a program called Connect with Tech, uh, where they will match Chromebooks and um, hotspots for six months of internet. Uh, they just they just uh, did contract. I just approved some contracts for it, so I happen to know that this is coming. Uh, but you could reach out to um, to their organization to see if that's something that we could point our residents to for those who don't qualify for City of Longmont type services. It is for, for older people, but um, depending on where they live, that might be a great option. That, that is a, that's a great program. And, um, and Lauren, as, as Lisa mentioned, uh, Michelle Waite, who's our senior services manager, is, uh, is connected with um, the AAA for Boulder County Perfect. and that program and the folks that are, are running that. So, um, so that's a great reminder that you know, we're, we're trying to tap into 
all the different resources to, to try to help get either um, internet or, and or tech devices um, in, in the hands of, of folks who don't have them so that they can, they can connect. But, but that's a great, great reminder. Yeah. And the nice thing is, is um, training is involved with this program too. Right. So it'll teach people how to, how to get online and, and use the technology, which it's probably a bigger barrier sometimes than getting the technology itself. <laughs> so I'm wondering if we need to kind of wait until maybe June-ish or so to take a look at this again. And um, I don't know, right now it's so cold. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you all want, well, well, I, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I, I really like the suggestion of just, you know, making sure Lisa is aware that we are interested and available but I think whatever we do needs to dovetail in with how she and her team are managing uh, each of those communities. But, um, you know, so first of all, we're available, and, you know, and second of all, I think that there are a lot of ways to communicate that, that uh, we may or may not be on top of. Uh, I've never been to one, but I, I've seen reference to the coffee with council um, mm -hmm. popping back up. So I don't know how, if that's all on zoom or if you're doing that, you know, outdoors at an actual coffee coffee shop but i think that's a similar concept and i know our our population may have more challenges on on technology than than the general population but um i think it's just i'm in favor of providing an opportunity holding ourselves out to lisa and and uh, letting her know that if she thinks it's appropriate within her management umbrella that um, we'd love to do it And to answer your question, we're doing the coffee with councils remotely. Um, first one was interesting um, because they have to call in uh, because mm -hmm. of just the open-ended piece in this. Um, we could rethink that in a different way because it's, it's a captive, for lack of a better word, we know who we need to invite. And so we can invite people from the facilities, which makes that a little bit easier than what we had to do on the coffee with council. And I think there's ways we can do it also. So everyone knows many of the affordable internet programs that we've established. I think there's a hundred meg program for $19 now. Um, and then we have other affordable opportunities via next Light. Those are all, if we have next Light in facilities, those are available for the people that live in the facilities. The difference in this case is the suites we were able to do a bulk deal um, where we're paying for it um, because of the requirements associated with the supportive services. So we're paying for internet connectivity there. Um, one of the things I talked to Karen about, and I'm kind of getting into the ops report a little bit, but to answer this question, um, next slide's also working with some folks that have different TV options. And so we're trying to understand what that looks like. So, um, even if we don't do the bulk deals for the facilities, residents have the ability to take advantage of some of these lower cost options for next light if it's available. And I think, I think we're almost every place in some form or fashion. It's a right, matter yeah. of getting them into the units. So I, I think the other thing that I would just add to this or, um, is that it, Terrell, uh, connecting with our residents um, after this really long year is is certainly top of mind on um, for Lisa, um, the team, our new team of community managers. Uh, you know, I think for the entire organization is figuring out ways we can start connecting with our residents um, in in whatever way is possible. So. We're checking the dial, the public health dial. The you know, residents are saying, "When are we going to open back up community areas?" So, so we're we're checking all that, um, and so it is top of mind for the staff, and um, and I think we will continue to look for opportunities. We are also, um, you know, working on a kind of a, a, a newsletter option too, and so that also might be a way, albeit kind of a one-way communication, but it, it could be ways that the board can at least. Um, reach out in that way. So, so we will we will make sure that um, we're talking about it and continuing to to explore opportunities as as they evolve um, with the with the pandemic. 
Well, that sounds good. Thank you, Arlene, for for uh, bringing this up again and and for the discussion. I think it's 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 time we start to focus on some of the things that we have forgotten about over the past ten months, and uh, this is this is an important first step. So, if there are no other discussion items on on four B, why don't we move on to four C, which is an update on the voluntary compliance agreement. And there is a brief letter in your packet, brief in terms of, I don't know how many, oh my gosh. Brief 18 page letter, something like that. Not that um, brief. <laughs> so I'm hoping someone will give us a summary of this. Uh, that would probably be me. <clears throat> so um, this is the first annual report to HUD. Um, giving an update on the voluntary compliance agreement and where we stand. <clears throat> um, there's been a lot of progress that's made, been made over the years. Um, the uh, item number 10, so things are numbered, but it doesn't make much sense. Kathy, your sound's so a little Kathy, off. So, Kathy, your your connection is off. I don't think it's a headset. What we may have to do is let her get out and come back in. Um, yeah, or, I, I'm here, Kathy. So if you want to exit the meeting, I'll let you right back in. I'm watching. And maybe just turn up your volume a little bit. Yeah, I can't hear you at all, Kath. And I was going to skip ahead to 4D, but I'm guessing that Kathy might be part of that one as well. Yeah, that would be. <laughs> Her internet looks good because the video is fine, but can't hear you, Kathy. I love that she has a backup just for the record. <laughs> I know. Mm -hmm. Headphones number three. I know. <laughs> if this doesn't work, she needs to get out, probably relaunch. Yeah, you're right, Harold. How about this? No, you're like roboting out, Kathy. So if you just want to leave it, I'll let you right back in. Sorry, I know it's frustrating. Um, Cameron, while she's doing that, if you want to go ahead um, on the city report, um, I want to do the update operations after E, but if we want to go ahead and ask uh, Lisa to do B and C. Uh, why don't we do that, Lisa? What? Oh, she's back. Maybe, maybe we got to stick with Kathy if okay. she pops in in a second here. Is this any better or no? No, you're going to have to restart your entire computer and then come in. All right. Why don't we jump to item five B, the Hearthstone Lodge budget update? Okay, Lisa, would well, you like to take it away? Sure. I'm excited to say that we have found the money to, for the Hearthstone and the Lodge to go ahead and implement the pendant system instead of the pull cords that we currently have in place. This will alleviate residents from being on call over hours and responding to the pull cords when somebody's fallen, a smoke detector is going off. This will be an automated system that the residents will either have a wristwatch or a necklace type pendant that they could push kind of like a life alert. It will only work inside the building. Um, and we hope to get that system approved today or tomorrow and work on getting it installed over the next 10 to 15 days. So we were able to find the money within the budget, um, different sources, but 
it, we're moving forward. So that's really exciting for me because it's been one of my priorities since I started. Anybody have questions on that? It's going through Best Buy as well. So they are backing the system. And then this is this sorry. is actually, a, I'm going to jump in um, with something too that we've been, our fire department and our public safety department has been wanting us to do uh, just because of the unique issues with the pull cords and then individuals responding and then calls for service coming in. And so this, we're, we're really excited about this on a number of fronts because it does get them connected to someone who can then triage, understand what the issue is, and then make the calls into the appropriate person. Um, and, and ultimately, we don't then need the, um, the people responding uh, from the facility and, and have to work through those issues. So we think this is an important step. I know Lisa and I have talked about <clears throat> and I've thought about the potential viability of expanding this to um, potentially other units as, as we can. This is a requirement for this facility because it's a 202 property. And so that's why we're having to, to do this here. Uh, but this is something that's definitely on our mind for other locations. So, so is, um, is this a microphone and a speaker then? Goes. No, what happens is when the resident activates it either by pushing the button, tapping the button, they will get a phone call to their phone that they've registered, either their cell phone or their personal phone. And then the dispatcher will, if they don't answer, they'll automatically um, dispatch EMS. But if the resident answers, they can kind of triage, see what the situation is, if it, they need police, medical, fire from there on. Gotcha. Or maintenance. <laughs> what and then if a resident uh, loses, misplaces, do we are we going to charge the resident for the fee, or are we going to uh, pick up the cost? They'll have to pay the replacement cost for the device, which I believe is twenty five dollars. Okay. Well, that sounds like and, an excellent addition. Lisa. Jean. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, um, is there a provision for um, when residents accidentally hit that button and well, they're that's nowhere why they near their phone? their cell phone or their phone number on um, call, whatever number they have listed, they'll call and see if it's a truly an emergency or if it was an accidental push. But we will also get reports daily and monthly of all the calls. So if we have a resident who's hitting it accidentally, we can always suggest them going from either the watch to the pendant around the neck mm -hmm. or some other way of um, carrying the device. Okay, yeah, because sometimes that'll happen and they're not with it within reach of their phone and yeah. um, they don't know they've done it. And, um, but I appreciate, yeah, let's see you know, the following up and I'm glad you're getting the reports. Great, great. And Lisa, when you say it works in the building, does it work for like a certain radius outside of the building in case someone has a fall or, or an emergency just outside the building, like yeah, a slip on be, ice? They said it should because there will be six repeaters, I believe per built six to nine repeaters per building. So it should work on the exterior as well. And the company should be able to detect what repeater it's coming off of. So if they're okay. not in their units, then it should at least say what vicinity of the building they are in. Okay, that's great. Excellent. Uh, any more discussion on the Hearthstone and Lodge? And if not, uh, Lisa, you want to talk about uh, 5C, your general update? Okay. Well, we've had a busy month. Um, hired another manager. She started on the 2nd of February, and so she is full-time at the suites and overseeing Aspen Meadows Senior in Aspen Meadows neighborhood. Her name is Corinne Lindsay. She's She's here with us now. So that completes our hiring for now. We're getting ready to do a couple audits. We have had audits at the Hearthstone and Lodge this month. And then Aspen Meadows Senior is also going through a file review as well for the um, rehab. Let's see. And then if we just look at the affordable gross potential rent report, it shows all the availabilities of what units we have rented. We we're making some progress. The suite who has the most units available out of the eight, I am excited to say now we have four rented. Um, 
Friday afternoon, another prospect from MHP was contacted and did all their paperwork. So we should be filling at least half those vacancies in the next two weeks. Any questions on the vacancies? Questions on any other management items going on? Yes, Arlene. Arlene, go ahead. On the village place, you've got that you reduce the rent. Um, does that kind of correspond with the rest of the units that are in there, or is this something new? We did, we went and reduced the rent on the two bedroom 60% unit because it has been vacant for a little over five months. And the loss, the vacancy loss we've um, had. We looked at that versus reducing the rent by about $200 to see if we could fill that unit um, was a significant difference. So we're hoping to rent that because we do have another two bedroom 60% that is on notice as well. So we don't want to stuck with two of them vacant for an extended amount of time. And what's so, the poverty uh, level on that? Is it 30 or 40% or 50? They are a 60% unit. Okay. Well, if we have nothing else on, on 5B or 5C, I see that Kathy has rejoined us. So why don't we jump back to 4C? And I'm, I'm crossing my fingers that the audio sounds crystal clear. Oh, no, it's not clear. So, Kathy, we can hear you a little bit, just faintly. Oh. Faintly. She's gonna she's gonna try again. So why don't we stick back down to the city report and let's <laughs> let's jump back to five A, Harold, if you don't mind. Or or Molly O'Donnell, I think is also I thought I saw oh, her. Okay, yeah, That's there's fine. Molly. So uh so Molly can certainly report on item five D if you wish. And then I'll hit five E in line. And I'm not hearing you, Molly. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> I had a note. It said microphone's not working, so I had to play around. <laughs> okay, so I am here to provide an update on the Aspen Meadows Apartments Rehab Project. So as of the end of this week, the 19th, we will be 80% complete with interior work. Um, the third floor south wing um, is a wing that we just completed. The move-in went smoothly for those residents. And right now the second floor south wing um, is uh, underway. And so that's the one that will be done by the end of this week. Um, doing those move-ins in two days was a challenge, but it went smoothly. We have um, Generally, residents were quite happy with how things went. We have a lot of support on site to, to make that happen. The gathering room is newly complete. Um, the mailboxes are switched over, the new mailboxes and operational. Um, the work on the interior during the next four weeks will include the completion of that second floor south wing units. And then upcoming will be the first floor south wing and that'll be the completion of all the units. The office and the first floor lobby continuation will also occur in this next round starting next week. Um, we are still waiting for our elevator and window replacement schedules because that once the units are complete, that's the last bit that will require relocation assistance. Um, we're still waiting for those. They won't schedule until they have all their orders in place and with COVID and things, lots of orders for things have been slow. Um, but they will most likely happen after the unit work is complete. So we will be working on that relocation process on a separate track. Um, we will are also going to update our resident survey. We did one regarding the elevator and how many residents might be um, totally dependent on that elevator to access their unit. We did that before construction, but because the elevator work is happening quite a bit later than the beginning of construction, we want to update that. So we'll be doing another outreach effort as soon as we have a schedule. The window replacements are a single day install though. So that's a, a smaller um, 
uh, coordination process. The exterior work that we've done to date is still the substantial completion of the roof. They haven't done anything with the winter weather, but most of the exterior work, including all the windows, will start in March and go through June. The whole job altogether in terms of contract billing is 43% complete. Um, we have a substantial amount of contingency and allowance budgets that we have not had to dip into because things have gone quite smoothly on that front. So we've um, been working to add some value added features and we're working to add some more currently. So we've already decided to go ahead and do the full parking lot paving. Only two thirds of that lot was included in the budget originally. Um, this will put all our asphalt in the same life cycle. Um, we also got city traffic engineering to agree to restrict parking on 21st, right next to that southeast entrance to the parking lot, just for safety. We've had a lot of close calls or even accidents there. Um, the, we've also added a common area furnishings package, including the gathering room, the resident business center, which is gonna be located now on the second floor and the property management office. Um, we're gonna be doing some safety improvements and ways to improve natural light in that office as well while we're doing this. Um, and then we've already completed an interior signage package to update the look of all the directional signing and unit numbering and make sure it's UFAS compliant. So that's already in, ongoing. Um, we are currently working on the following items to see if they are feasible. And well, some of them are feasible. We're just working on pricing and scope. The video security system to integrate with other LHA property systems landscaping upgrades, including possible garden boxes, because we know residents um, really enjoy gardening at, on site, and some patio furniture upgrades and ways to improve um, irrigation outside. So if there's any questions on that or any other suggestions for things we should look at for our value added features, we would love to have that. No questions, huh, or suggestions. Well, thank you, that's a great update. It sounds like we're making very good progress on that. Um, let's move on, Harold, to 5E, the progress on the LHA, LHDC structure and reorganization. Um, okay, and I also wanted to add to what Molly's working on. One of the things that we've done, and she mentioned it, is the video security system is really the, when, when we started this, we talked about creating consistent um, using consistent technology across all, all of our facilities. And that's uh, a couple of things that we've caught. One, um, the door system is something that we caught and bringing that in, so it's consistent what we have at our other facilities. The cameras, the camera conversation just for this group to know is also, um, we've got two camera systems, one on the neighborhood. Um, and then this one that interact with each other. The camera system at the neighborhood is old. And if you remember, this is one that we're having a lot of trouble with just getting into the system. And so we're working both of those for the neighborhood and for the apartments, but where they will interact with each other and be essentially on the same platform. The key for this, and this is tied into the security work that um, we've got the bid at Village Place Apartments to do based on some issues we were having there, is that there's also going to be a web platform so you have remote access into those systems should you need it. And, and what we want to do then eventually is have a consistent plat platform across all the facilities so that we don't continue having the one-offs as we're moving forward. Um, Lisa didn't talk about that, but that's the same work that she's doing with the maintenance staff right now in terms of um, things like faucets and um, sinks. And so we, we can just do that. And, and so it's really good work. In terms of the um, progress on the LHA, LHDC structure reorganization, um, this is one that we're gonna need to spend some time with the board on. Um, the LHA board, which would be the, the city council members at this time. We have um, two, two attorneys working on this issue. One is Chris Gunlickson. You all may have seen Chris in previous conversations because he is doing a lot of the financing. He did a lot of the legal work on the financing work that we've done for many of our facilities. He's actually um, representing the development corporation on the housing authority side, we're utilizing and working with Ben Doyle. Uh, ben used to be um, a county attorney. He's now in private practice, 
but Ben was the one that actually did all of the work um, or most of the work in terms of the change that they made at the county um, and, and really how the county commissioners became the, um, the actual housing authority board and, and they worked through their processes. And so Glenn or um, Chris and Ben are really giving us two different viewpoints based on their perspectives. Um, we hope to have um, a report from them in the next couple of weeks. Um, well, let's say next two to four weeks in terms of a, <clears throat> excuse me, a high level report in, in terms of their recommendation. The, the big piece on this is there's a couple of things in place. So if you all will remember when we talked to you about the, um, the report from Betsy Martins, and she really talked about the change in the HUD conditions and combining the development corporation model with the housing authority, and that really strengthens the financial position of both organizations when you do this and the fact that HUD now looks at it in a different way than they did when you had to have the development corporation so that's a piece in terms of the financial side of the equation. What we're also trying to understand is the liability component to this and how you can carve that liability piece out um, into the, into the e each individual housing unit and whether or not it makes sense to have the development corporation exist in some form based on the liability. Um, and, and we're going to get, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm expecting we're going to get two different, um, legal responses on this in terms of what that looks like. And then it really is going to be an evaluation of, of what is the risk in, in doing this. But, um, you, you know, the, we think that at least in the interim, you know, as we talked about with you all, the development corporation still needs to exist, um, and until we can get to a point to, to make <clears throat> some final decisions. It also will tie into a little bit in terms of some development opportunities that are coming into play and how we can utilize it. And, um, um, and once Kathy joins, we'll talk about that. But my hope is actually, you know, by uh, April, that no later than April, we have some, a clear sense of the recommendation we're going to make to both you all and the housing authority board on this issue and where we want to go and, and how we want to move there. Um, in this, depending on the path that we take, it could be anywhere from a nine month to nine to 12 month untangling of all of the financial components in, in many of these properties. And so um, they will give us a sense of what that will take too, in terms of the time of the actual untangling and, and moving it into the housing authority, if, we, if that's the direction that the board wants to go. Um, so uh, making progress, that was something we kind of, we kept pushing out because we needed to deal with more of the immediate operational issues. Um, but I should have a report within the next month based on the conversation I had on uh, Friday with our legal representation on this um, internally. Any questions? So Harold, my understanding is that the LHDC board is still meeting regularly to. Uh, they're not meeting regularly. Okay. Um, they're meeting. They're meeting. What we talked about with them is we'll meet as needed, um, okay. and they will have um, under their bylaws. They have to have I think one meeting a year, and there's not a lot of activity, so there's really not a need for them to meet right now. Um, and that's what we, we had to work with them because if you'll remember, they wanted to um, have this completed by the end of the year and that was um, impossible. Right. Um, so that, that was the agreement we had. We're, we're also thinking about options um, depending on timelines if we need to find a different way to appoint, appoint other board members if we need to go longer, if they actually want to, to, to stop serving in that capacity. So that's some of the things we're going to look at. Okay. Um, in terms of update on operations, you all may hear um, last night we had a, um, a, a sprinkler burst, pipe burst because of the cold at the suites. Um, I want to commend Lisa, Corinne, Dennis, 
Lydell and the work that they did. We were pretty fortunate um, when we went out there, it actually burst in the stairwell. And so in terms of the number of units that were impacted when we first heard it, it was one of those moments where we were like, oh, how bad is this going to be? Um, fortunately, when we got in, we only there were only three units that had water in them, at least a lot of water in them. Um, so we made plans working with Karen and the group to relocate three people. At the end of the day, we only had to relocate one person uh, because 24-7 responded very quickly um, to get into the units. And, um, you know, really thankful for them because it wasn't just uh, the housing, uh, housing authority going through this. Apparently, there were many other uh, multifamily units experiencing the same thing. Um, but based on the number of units that were potentially impacted, the work that we've done with them, they were able to respond to our facility. Very, it, it, I think they were there within an hour of when they got the call. Uh, so it went really well in terms of uh, the water removal. They're going to be there again today to, to really look at the moisture content in the walls and see what we have to do in terms of a more permanent uh, drying that we need to do and how how aggressive we need to be in that process um we are trying to schedule a meeting um, with the housing authority board we were going to try to do this um in conjunction with our normal city council meetings and so you all know um, how we handle the general improvement district they adjourn as a city council then they reconvene as the general improvement district they would do the same thing here we actually talked to the city council last week about the fact that we have so much stuff we need to go over as they jump into this role and bring your recommendations to them that we're going to need a special meeting we're trying to schedule that right now and, and get that on the books um we may be able to get it um you, you know we try to schedule at midday friday just in case you all are interested um, had some folks with some scheduling issues. We we could potentially do it from three to five on Friday. Um, so um, we're sending out emails. If not, we're going to have to get it next week. And when we do that, we will um, we will let you all know. And that may be something where um, at, at least the chair, if the chair is available, to be part of that conversation and kind of help this transition as we're moving forward. But we will. Sorry. Um, we will let you all know. Karen, Kathy, have I missed anything? Karen? So, um, so, so the two things that I would add is that uh, last week we had a, a very successful um, vaccination clinic at um, Hearthstone and, and Lodge. And so um, and village place. So, um, so basically, uh, we pretty much had a, a, a full day, um, half day to Hearthstone Lodge, half day to, at village place. And, um, and, and we were able to um, have uh, 43 total vaccinations at um, Hearthstone Lodge and 33 at the village place, all the vaccinations were used. Um, so Michelle, and Lisa and her community managers were, um, they had a plan A, plan B, plan C, so that we made sure that we used all of the vaccinations. Uh, we, um, so we had 70 plus year olds, 65 to 69. And then if there were any vaccinations less, we had pe left, we had people on standby so they could uh, come in and get vaccinated. The second clinic is set for Tuesday, February 23rd. Um, and that will, um, and, and that will basically, that's going to be at Fall River, I believe. And, and we will target the residents of Fall River, Spring Creek and um, Aspen Meadows Senior ap Apartments. And so that will be um, 80 people that we will schedule for, um, for that, that second clinic. So so he, it was just a, it was a great, great success, a lot of work, um, certainly partnering with uh, public health, um, with King Supers, which uh, actually provided the uh, vaccinations and, um, you, you know, and just, um, you know, just the, the gratitude from the residents in our facilities that, um, you, you know, that they were able to um, access a vaccination um, and a vaccine um, in their own 
backyard was, um, you know, was, was pretty, they were very grateful, I guess I should say. Yeah. That's wonderful, Jean. Yeah, yeah, Karen, can I, I'm gonna add to that too, because um, uh, obviously this was a very efficient operation and there were two openings at Hearthstone and Amy called two of the residents here who are extremely vulnerable. And I'm, I'm just really delighted how efficient uh, the whole operation went. So kudos to everybody involved. Yeah, and I think to that point, we talk a lot about, you know, we've talked a lot about what we're doing, uh, but I will also say this has been a unique opportunity for us as a city um, because they were able to do this at the facilities. We're now talking about the folks that work for the city who are over 70 who may not have been able to be vaccinated to see if we can include them in this as well. And so there are, you know, what we're now seeing is the give and take between both sides of the house in terms of how we all help each other in different ways. And I wanted to point that out because a lot of times we focus on this side, but this is a piece where this has really become a, a, a you know, a, a great issue for us, the city structure and the community in general, in terms of being able to have these conversations. This is a model in my conversations on the other side that they're really testing this pop-up piece and how that's going to work as we get more vaccine so that we can then bring that out and really target other populations within our community. So this is a test for the broader county as well. And they've done it in Longmont with the Housing Authority, Boulder Housing Partners, and Boulder County Housing Authority um, in, in this testing process. And, and the only other uh, announcement that I would make under operations is that we were able to um, hire, and she started last week, would be uh, our new housing choice voucher specialist. Her name is Rhonda Hill, and, um, and so she is now on board, um, and so we have both housing choice voucher specialists um, in, in operation, and uh, yeah, it's, it's good to be good to have pretty full staff. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, that's nice. Well, and, and what I will say, and, and this is as, as much for Dennis Lydell, Corinne, and Lisa, um, rock stars last night. That was my call to, to Karen when I left the facility and went the rock stars, um, just seeing the process that they, they went through, how they were handling the situation. Um, you know, it was different this time. And, and, and that's really a testament to the work that they've been doing. I also wanted to let you all know that when you go into facilities, you can get a sense in the, in the field just how people interact with you and how things are going. Um, and I will tell you that um, this, is, this is where the work that everyone's been doing, where you kind of come away and you go, okay, we're making progress. Interaction has been much different. Um, at the suites for me last night during a crisis versus other times just in terms of the involvement and the interaction that they're having with the folks that live in the facilities and the and, the, and that's paying off in different ways and and you know I asked the question to Corinne how's it going because she's in the facility and, and and she's like it's fine and, and just seeing how they were interacting with both Lisa and Corinne in the process was phenomenal and how quickly they got a hold of it in this situation. So I wanted to just publicly say, great job, everyone that did it. And it was a much different, um, it was just different this time around. And so thank you. But I'll also say that I'm seeing that as I move to other facilities and some of the interaction and, you know, I received a note from an individual at the lodge in Hearthstone. Um, and who's there? I forgot. Great. Um, Andrea. Andrea and, and that. And so we're now seeing um, everything we wanted to see. It's now really starting to, to take place in, in terms of the, the positive relationship that we're seeing with people in, in the different facilities. So I wanted to add that as part of the operational report. Kathy, Karen, Michelle, everybody's doing a great job um, in, in this. And, and we're now rounding the corner. And so I wanted you all to know that. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, it hasn't been easy to get here, so uh, it, it's great where we are, but I don't want to forget <laughs> the, the slog that it was to, to get here. And, and it's those those of you that have, that are on the screen here that uh, kind of helped us make that progress. So I'm I'm losing track of my alphabet, but I'm looking at section five. Tom, do you have some input? Yeah, can I have a, a, a quick question on that? It, it's great to hear that we're fully staffed, but I remember a couple of meetings ago, how are we treating the new employees now? Are, are we having them be city employees or are they also LHA employees? And I thought we had also talked about that moving possibly the LHA employees over to the city as well. Yeah, we missed that one. Um, and so that's what we're working on now. So we did get direction. Um, that, that's part of why we need the meeting with um, the council as the housing authority board. So on the city side, we did get direction to do that. Um, and I think that was part of um, why people have been more interested in per terms of this conversation. So we are going to move forward with that, but we need to have now the meeting on the housing authority board with the council members so they can give us official direction and we can do this. We've started the conversations. And so some things are going to be pretty easy. Um, things like health insurance, vision insurance. And I've talked, we've talked to staff about this already. Um, those things are going to be pretty easy. The one that's going to take a little more research is actually the retirement side in terms of prior service credit. I mean, how, how do we deal with these things? Um, and, and in some ways, um, this is really going to be focused on the folks that are have been here longer and and than the new folks because it's a different issue and so we've brought jim golden in and we've created a transition team just on this piece um to get that done and we our target is march 31st knowing that depending on what we hear on the retirement side that could be an overly aggressive target but we still wanted to set a, a target date because um, deadlines um, stimulate progress um, on this. At the same time, um, just so you all know, associated with this is also the move of the individuals. And we talked to staff about this and getting them into the civic center with us um, so that it, it's a honestly easier for us to manage. So Karen's not having to be and Kathy not in two offices, but also get folks closer to me as we continue to evolve and evolve in this structure. So those are two pieces that is easier to do. And we hope that we can move that a little more quickly. The challenge on that side is actually the files and, and, and where and how do we store the files? Um, we found places and we can figure it out. Um, but for the files. And so we're working on those pieces. So sorry, I forgot to mention that, but that's another thing in the mix. And what I would add to that is that we do have task teams that have formed um, around, around that work. So around what um, Harold talked about um, earlier in terms of the structure, we have a task team that's looking at the transition of LHA staff to become city staff. Um, we have, we have some of us that are working on the physical move and what the heck to do with those files because it's kind of a, it's a domino, it's a domino effect. So certainly the, um, the housing choice voucher specialist staff need, need their files. They need access to those files. And, um, and so there, there are multiple um, file storage uh, issues that we're looking at with um, certainly the LHA, but also with the, the city and, and our file storage. So, um, so we do have task teams that are, have formed, we formed those a couple of weeks ago to Harold's point is, you know, we just need to get moving. We set some target dates and even if we have to push those out, we, we need to have some, um, some milestone targets to, to, to shoot for. And just so you all know, as advisory board, and this is important too, and we're going to have to talk to um, the housing authority board. Um, we have different task teams. I'm on every one of the task teams because from a structural and liability perspective, that decision-making has to be in me in, in this blend as we're moving forward. And so I, I bring that up because that's going to be an important piece that you'll see in terms of the liability conversations and everything we're having. And then I will take 
if needed, I will take that to the appropriate board to make the decision, or if it's within my authority in the exec interim executive director role, then I'll make it. But we've got to do that to really compartmentalize all of these issues and keep everything separate. All right, anything else on the uh, city report that I've glossed over? Seeing nothing, we're gonna go, we're gonna hope that the third time is the charm and jump back to Kathy for an update on the voluntary compliance agreement. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, all right. Oh, beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> My husband gave me the wireless ones for Valentine's Day, and obviously I haven't worked out the kinks yet, so I have to work on that. Um, so for the voluntary compliance agreement, um, this is the first annual report to HUD that's required. We're going to have to do this report annually um, until we're out of um, out from under the agreement. Um, and it, again, the um, numbers for the items don't make any sense, but that is how they were laid out in the HUD um, agreement. So we're going with them because it's easier to keep track of it. But for you guys, it won't make too much sense. Um, so just a brief update. Um, number 10, the monetary relief for tenants. I believe the completed status on that first page is really December 11th, 2019. That's when we agreed um, that this needed to, to happen. And then it was actually completed with full payout in February of 2020. So I think that that first date's just an error. Um, the, um, the fair housing training, the public interest provision, what, uh, I don't know quite why it's called that, but it's really ensuring that um, new staff have fair housing training and section 504 um, accessibility training. And we have been working on that. Everyone who was um, in place as of um, July 21st received training. And then as folks have been hired, we have been um, identifying additional training um, for them to, um, to take so that we can keep um, Keep moving on that. Um, <clears throat> number 12, which is the unit accessibility um, is um, really looking at, and 12 through 16 are kind of all tied together with this. That's the survey of all of our units and all of our common areas in every building, including the admin building and 615 main. Um, they're all tied together. We have to survey all of those. We have to analyze what needs to happen to become um, UFAS compliant, which is um, Uniform Federal Accessibility Standards, which is what HUD requires. It's um, above and beyond ADA standards, which is what the city code requires. <clears throat> um, so do an analysis of what um, needs to happen around that, and then do a, a, a transition plan on what the needs are and how we're going to enact um, the changes that need to happen, whether it's a rehab that can happen within units or whether it is somehow in new in upcoming buildings making more than the required number of um, UFAS units. Um, and how are we going to afford that? And that plan, um, the analysis, the survey, the plan has to be um, in place and to HUD be by November of 2021. So hopefully this summer, as we were talking about, we can get in and do start doing inspections um, of the units and the buildings um, in a way that makes sense and um, is still safe and everything. So that's the biggest piece that we still have to have to take on. And again, that covers um, number 12 through number 16, um, basically. Um, Number 15 kind of inserted in that, um, as you all may know, we were able to do seven UFAS compliant units at um, as part of the um, Aspen Meadows Senior Apartments re renovation. Um, and we do have a third party architectural firm um, inspecting those units. HUD has accepted that firm. And so those units are um, going to be in full compliance with UFAS. So we'll have seven units by the time Aspen Meadows Apartments is, is renovated. So um, that is um, helping helping with that at least. We should not have to go through and survey Aspen Meadows Senior Apartments as part of the overall survey. 
Um, and then there were a number of policies that we needed to um, put in place or um, beef up or enact. Um, and they include um, number 17, which is the section 504 reasonable accommodation policy, number 19, which is effective communications, number 20, which is the 504 non-discrimination notice, number 20, one, which is transfer policy, and number 23, which is assisted uh, assistance animals policy. Those have all been um, written, approved by HUD, adopted, and are in place. And we are starting actually later on uh, this morning to roll those out to the community managers to make sure they fully understand them and then put in place a plan to roll them out to all of our residents in a way that's understandable, that doesn't overwhelm them, <laughs> um, and that they, um, they um, know how to access um, those um, policies and um, the rights that are given to them. And then also, how do we incorporate them in um, providing them to all of our applicants um, that we might have in the future? And that plan has to be in place by um, April 15th so we can report back to HUD. <clears throat> um, we also, as part of the 504 policy um, number 18, which is um, logging, tracking the 504 accommodation requests that we received and how we address those, um, that ha log has been turned into HUD. Um, we did process 38 requests um, in 2020. Um, there were four denials um, and one um, I had requested more information. Everyone else was pretty much approved. Um, 13 of the 38 came from um, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, and most of those were related to needing an additional bedroom to accommodate um, either a disability or medical equipment or something like that. Um, and then 25 of them were in our, our own properties. So just a little trivia for you there on, on what we had, um, had reviewed this year. Um, the transfer policy, what we're finding um, on, not the policy necessarily, but with number 25, which is um, making sure that there's lease addendums around the ADA units. So if we have people who do not have a disability that are in an ADA designated unit, they just need to understand they can be in there, but if uh, somebody that has a disability needs to go into that unit, they have to um, <clears throat> transfer to another unit at their own cost. Um, so the policies in place, we are working with the folks who are in the ADA units <clears throat> that might not have a disability. And there's really, we have found there's quite a few more. We're still getting the numbers together, but there's quite a few more than we thought um, were um, would be applicable in this section. Um, so we are going through those and we're trying to determine, because some of those folks have been in there a long time, in their units a long time. For instance, Village Place, some of them have been in there for a decade or more <clears throat> in an ADA unit. So it's very possible they now could qualify. So going back and, and seeing what their circumstances are and can we, um, through a reasonable accommodation policy, make them eligible for the unit so that they would not have to transfer if somebody else needed it. So there's just a lot of cleanup work that we're trying to do um, around that. So <clears throat> we'll be um, working on that. And that is, um, we've been extended for that until... <sighs> April 15th as well. So we're working on, on that. Um, we do have uh, a revised application in place and are starting to use that. And we're pulling together the accessible housing list. Um, this is a list of just units that are uh, of properties that should have ADA compliant units. Um, so it's really going back and, and getting a list and which I really, I think I have a pretty good list already through my city work of developments over the past um, 10 years or so that have had to comply with ADA so that they should have units. We don't have to check and see if they're actually available or anything like that, just that um, that listing is available to them. Um, and everything else is complete on the rep record keeping around um, different data sets and stuff like that. So um, 
making progress. Biggest area is going to be the analysis of the units um, and then getting some of the policies in place and just um, normalized within um, how we distribute those and make those available to folks. Are there any questions on that? Arlene. I know this is going to surprise you that I have questions, but they're really sort of a clarification. Um, under 12, where you're talking the unit accessibility and the 5% of the units have to be um, accessible, is that 5% per development or per uh, building, or is that total? So of the 461, as compared to, say, for instance, 60 at Spring Creek or Falk, Fall River. How does that so, work? Yeah, so as a development is built, 5% of all the units have to be meet, uh, be compliant normally. But because okay. we're now not compliant, um, according to HUD, we are compliant with ADA. Let me make that clear. We're compliant with ADA because that is the city's building code and everything met those requirements. It's the UFAS, the additional requirement that we're not compliant with. So HUD reads this that 5% of all units have to be UFAS compliant. That's okay. what we're not compliant with. So probably what's gonna happen if we can't go in and retrofit. So for instance, let me give you a for instance, Spring Creek, <clears throat> the units, um, toilets are two and have to be, um, what is it? 12 inches off center, whatever the requirement is. There's a two inch difference. <laughs> There's a two inch difference. And so the solution is to, you can carve out a niche so that it moves the drywall over two inches, inches. or you can move the toilet so that it is on center. And the problem with that is in some of our apartments, there's radiant floor heating and that would mess that up. So mm -hmm. it's like thousands of dollars to correct it. Mm -hmm. So if you can't correct whatever the issue is, and that's what the survey is gonna tell us what exactly the issue is in every single unit. <clears throat> if you can't correct it, then the next thing is, well, in your next building, can you build 10% UFAS eligible so that overall the development or the, our properties, our holdings are going to be compliant. Okay, okay. All right, um, so under 16, under alterations, mm -hmm. it's, it's saying that, you know, that lists a bunch of different alterations there. If for instance, one item is done, does that meet the requirements? So for instance, my question is, if we redo the door hardware, is that gonna meet that requirement? Or we'll meet it, it for that person? particular area, but it, if there's still other things that we can't do, then it, the whole unit isn't going to meet it. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I know you talked a little bit about how many places are actually um, accessible. If a person, if on your waiting list, you have a person who just needs a regular place and a person who needs an accessible unit, and you have an accessible unit available, how do you determine who gets that? Well, if the person who needs an accessible unit and there's an accessible unit um, available, that's where we're going to, to put them. The Even only if they're farther down the waiting list? Or does that make a difference? No, they do go up to the top of the waiting list if there's a accessibility need and we have a unit available. Okay. Um, right, Lisa, I think that's correct. Um, if somebody, if, if all th other things being equal, who's, who's, uh, and there's a unit, uh, accessible unit that's available and nobody has a disability, then we're going to offer the unit to get it rented. It's mm -hmm. not going to just mm -hmm. sit, you know, but then the explanation should be given immediately. This is an ADA unit. We're putting you in here. If you accept it, you could have, you to, have to move. Right, exactly. Okay. And there's a lease addendum yeah. that they'll need to sign. Okay. And then last, um, on 28, where you're talking about um, ethnicity, race and ethnicity, is this a requirement when people sign up or is this an option? 
they have the option, we have the requirement to report whatever information we get. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I will say that uh, for, for anyone who wasn't involved at the beginning of the VCA process, this is a good eye opener as to just the complexity of of everything involved and how challenging it is to work through it. But I'm, I'm amazed at how thoroughly that you've taken us through it. So I appreciate the work. Any other questions or comments on the VCA report? Tom? And it, just a quick question. I mean, this is great to see. Uh, 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 and we're on schedule to meet the April 15th deadline? Yes. Perfect. That's all I had. Okay. Let's, uh, let's jump to the Sunset Heights project update. Harold, you gonna do it or you want me to start? Why don't you start and then we'll jump in. I'll take the development piece, you take the... Sun, Sunset Heights update? Right. Okay. Um, so um, Element, um, who we are partnering with um, on the suites property and have a um, sale option, um, which they have enacted um, for at least part of the land. Um, they submitted their application to Chaffa for 9% credits February 2nd, I believe it was. Um, so we have been working with them, um, continuing to work with them on partnership agreements as well for um, LHA to be the um, property manager at that property if they do get funded. Um, and then um, continuing to work on um, providing support services as well, which is likely to be either the Boulder Shelter for the homeless or um, LHA. Um, so still kind of working on that a little bit. Um, so we should find out, I think in May is when they'll start um, making announcements around who will be funded. Um, it is, I think, looking pretty good. They did apply last time and usually the second time you're in. Um, you know, barring really heavy competition. Um, and there is, because it's permanent supportive housing, there's a, a leg up on that. The um, Chaffa and DOH are particularly looking to fund those types of projects. So we will um, keep you posted on that. Um, they are carving out the southwest corner um, for this particular property. So they did move it down, I think a little bit maybe um, on the property from what the last time that we had reported to you. Um, so if that is um, funded, then they are already have submitted um, some plans to um, planning to start the development process and they will um, subdivide the property then um, in conjunction um, with the LHA uh, on what that will, will look like as we move forward. So kind of exciting, we'll see what happens. Um, as we move forward and keep you posted on that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sh uh, share a screen with you all. Um, I'm trying to actually get it down so you can see it. Uh, so on the development side, we're working through a couple of issues um, in terms of um, replatting and what that's gonna look like. Um, or in, in this case, a replat was triggered because of the way the property has to be um, given to element for this project um, and so that's creating some minor um, issues that we need to deal with but here is what the site plan is going to look like so if you can see uh, parking lot here um, this is the suites um, and then you can see this area here where they're moving it to this location we're having to work um, and look at um, you know and this this point here in terms of ingress egress to meet fire code. Um, I am going to have to have some conversations with the village at the peaks on this issue. We're tracking down some easements that are showing up on the plat, but we can't really find. Um, so we're going to be working on that in, in this area. And then that gives us the ability to potentially do something here. And then on the backside for additional units. 
Um, this is, you know, you know, for those of you all that may remember Fall River, this was part of the property that the city purchased to help the financing for Fall River to, to complete that capital stack of which now we own 59% of the property, which has created some of the changes in, 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 in what we're working through now. But to let you all know, in terms of the operational piece, um, when we met with Kevin, um, I was pretty much adamant that said, if this is gonna happen, the housing authority will be the manager of the property. And that's again, so you all tie it into the budget. That's what brings additional revenue into the system in order to do this. Um, the question on supportive services, that's a little more nuanced. And so you all know that we have uh, mental health partners at the suites. Um, uh, the supportive side is has a lot of requirements with it, which is why um, Kathy mentioned um, the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless, because they, they do that now in partnership with Element, I think at, what's the name of the property, Kathy? Kester, uh Lee Hill. Lee Hill. Lee Hill. Lee Hill. Mm -hmm. So they currently provide that service. So you need somebody who provides it and, and really knows what they're doing in this case. So that's part of the conversation. That's also part of, do we fit in this? Um, but in the conversation we had last week, it really then is also about connecting these two properties. So we have more robust supportive services for everyone in this location. Um, actually connect them via, connecting them via technology from an operating expense. It then allows us to, to, you know, we have to monitor who comes in and out of these properties. Well, when you connect it via technology and the system that we've talked about earlier that we're putting in with cameras, it allows one person to do it at one facility or the other, especially overnight. And so there's a lot of things that we're, we're still building into this process, but I'm really excited about this opportunity and what it means for our community. And um, let's, let's all keep our fingers crossed that they, they can get the tax credits and, and we can begin moving forward on this project. Kathy, do you wanna tell them about the other one that came up last week? <laughs> so in searching through um, to try and find the easement, private easement that um, Harold was talking about for Element, I've been going through a lot of the plans and the, the files um, and came across um, a lease agreement that, um, oh, I just forget the name of the partnership. Um, the investors in Chrisman, um, the Chrisman developers um, had for the property that is just to the north of the Chrisman apartment. So it fronts on 66 and is behind the gas station and north of the Chrisman apartments um, there by Sonic um, at about 24th and main area. Um, and so I saw that they had a lease agreement, it looked like that ran through 2022. Um, and I know they had come to the LHA board, um, right before things started crashing and burning with, um, <laughs> with, with Jillian and everything, um, and had asked to partner and whether or not the LHA could, um, could purchase the property and hold it um, until they were ready to move forward. And the answer was no. Um, and so anyway, I found this agreement. And so I just emailed um, one of the guys at the Christman development just said, do you still have this lease agreement? And are you still looking to, to develop? And I did get a response that no, they don't have the lease agreement. They never put it in place, but they've been talking with the owners. The owners are still interested in selling. And if we're still interested, they would still be interested. So Harold and I are gonna meet with them next week. I think it's early next week um, about the possibility. So there might, might be something coming, we're not sure um, what that might look like, whether it's another um, Christman-like development or what it would be, but, or if it's even feasible, um, et cetera. But at least we're exploring that. Um, so it just kind of cropped up. <laughs> Yeah, and I think why we're, we're we moved that one along a little bit faster is because, um, again, revenue generation, and in terms of the agreement and what we get out of it versus what we're putting in, um, it just makes sense for us to have that conversation. Jean. Yeah, um, I I want to clarify. I, I I need clarification here. 
um, the lease agreement you found, which Christmas says they don't have a copy of, uh, relates to the apartments that were going to be built or the ones that have already been built in that area? No, they, they do have a copy of it. They oh, weren't they aware of what it was. They just okay. hadn't entered into it. Okay. Um, or they had let it lapse or uh, um, whatever. whatever. But no, it's for the property to the north. So new, total new development. Totally new. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because um, Cameron, if you'll remember, um, we were told um, as the board that uh, LHA was going to take over the management of the uh, uh, Christmas apartments that were built a couple of years ago. Do you remember that? Yeah. I, I have a vague recollection. Yeah, that um, Christman the Apartments got up and running, and then in five years, LHA was to take over the management of that also. Okay, yeah. So I and when you when you were talking about um, you know the element situ you know the, the situation around the suites, um, I was wondering about where we were with that with that property, and um, is that in our to do list? And I'm, it seems to me that we've got about two years to go on it um, before we take it over. Yeah. But that's something that I, I'd like to an update on it. Yeah, so I think the answer is yes, um, in five years. And so we have two years to go. So yeah. that's, we, we will, my intent on something like that would be to probably start prepping a year out. So not, so we still have another year before we start prepping on that. But if we're doing a new deal with those folks, we can solidify it and, and bring it back to everyone's attention. Yeah, that, it, may, it may change. It may, I mean, we may change a lot of things based on if we can do this and what makes the most sense for us operationally and financially in terms of the deal structure on the other side too. So those are all things we'll have to work through. Well, it is kind of kind of fun to be talking about development deals again, uh, rather than just putting out fires. I know the fires are probably still smoldering, so I don't want to get complacent. But um, it's it's another sign that things are starting to gain a little momentum. <clears throat> so we have bounced around our agenda, but I believe, unless someone corrects me, that we've covered everything in one through five at this point. And so I'm going to turn to item six. And see if there's any other business that anyone would like to discuss this morning. Arlene. I just have a question about security at the buildings. Mm -hmm. Does the security system on the outside doors lock down at a certain time at night so that only people can get in there that have the code to get in or is, are the facilities open 24 seven? I'm trying to think through. So on. Do you want Lisa to take that? Yeah, because they're different for properties. Yeah. And so I'm trying to, Lisa, right. do you want to jump in? So all the entry doors are locked 24 seven. They have to either have their fob or a code to get into the building. So okay. that allows only residents or those who have been approved to have a fob get into the building. Otherwise, they have to be buzzed in or let in via calling through the call box at any time of day. The okay. common areas are open and they're not secured, but they're inside the building that is secured. So to get to the common areas, you'd have to be buzzed in. Correct. Okay. Do we have any other business? All right, if that's the case, we'll move on to item seven and I'd entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting today and remind everyone that we have another meeting one month from today, which I think would be the third Tuesday of March. March if that's, that's correct. So, Before we ahead. adjourn, I just wanna let you guys know, um, depending on how things go with this baby that I'm about to have in the next seven weeks, um, I may or may not be here for the March 
meeting. I'm hoping she comes early and gives me a little relief from this awful pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> so I may not see you next month. I may see you. I might look more miserable than I do now. <laughs> <But> <laughs> keep me in your prayers. <laughs> you got it. You well, got well it. good luck. You are allowed yes. to use that excuse once a year or so. Uh, it becomes a more frequent issue. We'll have to look into it a little and, and more you, closely. And you do not look miserable. So no. you're hiding it well. <laughs> so. I've been practicing. I'm, I think I'm experiencing uh, early prodromal labor. So it's like not quite Braxton Hicks, but it's not labor either. Yeah. It's like right in the middle and it's not fun. Yeah. Well, um, well, we wish you all the best. Thank you. Yeah, I wish you all the best as my two are getting ready. One leaves the college next year, the other the year after. Um, just take advantage of the time because I'm having a moment right now where I'm going, yeah. man, it went fast. So I know yeah. mm-hmm. I have a three-year-old and then I'll have yeah. another and that's it. And I'm just like, wow, I have 18 summers, 18 mm-hmm. summers. And that's it. And yeah. it's sad. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, Holly. Well, thank you. Trust me. They'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Uh, I will welcome them back home if ever, but hopefully they yeah. won't need to by then. <laughs> I'll miss you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks guys. All right. Well, that's a great way to wrap up the meeting. You got it. Yeah. And I, I will move to adjourn. Second. I we got second. a motion in a second. All in favor. Good to go. Yeah. We'll see you next month. Thank you. <laughs>